so I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, the title of this talk is Putting Rails in a Corner, Understanding Database Isolation. And that was originally a reference to a quote from the movie Dirty Dancing, but much like a lot of lines from 80s movies, it kind of came out of nowhere and doesn't really go anywhere. So this isn't really going to be a Dirty Dancing themed uh, talk, but instead you get this lovely botanical illustrations, um, which, which I find quite nice. Um, so I'm Emil, and um, I'm now, uh, as of the last hour or so, a software writer at Binti. <laughs> um, and uh, Binti is a great company. Uh, we work in the uh, GovTech space, working with foster agencies with the goal of uh, helping to find every child uh, a family. And um, we're hiring, if you want to talk to us about that. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I've got my handle at the bottom right hand corner if at any time you uh, want to tweet something about the talk. Um, I talk about computers on there sometimes, but mostly uh, like music theory and jazz and sometimes cute animals. Cool. Um, so let me answer the first question that's all on your minds right now is should you try and sneak out uh, or else who might benefit from this talk? Um, so say that you uh, have some controller actions that you wrapped in a, in a transaction, and you're finding that you're still having inconsistent data afterwards. Um, stick around, this is probably for you. Um, if you have slow back, big slow background jobs that uh, use active job or something like that, and those need to run transactions, this is another good, uh, another good candidate. Um, or if you simply write anything to the database that's based on something that you read from the database. Uh, so really quite, quite general. Um, in other words, people who need confidence in their data and, and probably use a SQL database. Otherwise, this might not apply as much. Um, but if, on the other hand, somebody just called you and said that they've got some ice cream and it's going to melt, uh, like totally, that sounds better. So <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to duck out. Um, great. So, uh, thanks for staying, <laughs> and um, let me uh, just make a kind of meta note before we, we really dive in. Um, so this is, this is kind of a dense topic, and I wouldn't, I think the takeaway here is not that you'd be able to walk away and like immediately write code um, based on, you know, setting and configuring database isolation levels. So. Uh, I'd recommend that you just kind of get a sense of the kind of problems that um, are affected by the space and, and how you might um, think about configuration, and then just remember some terms and uh, go back and search for it later. Um, cool. So uh, let's consider the context that we're talking about. So we're talking about transactions. Um, we're talking about um, how they interact with ORMs and especially uh, active record. And um, it was awesome that DHH set this uh, term up in our mind of leaky abstractions, because that's what this is all about and why we still need to talk about this. Um, so just a reminder on transactions, um, they're really like a sequence of interactions with the database that um, really you hope have, uh, in a lot of cases, these following properties. So if you've heard the term ACID, um, it's an acronym that stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. Um, atomicity means that either everything that you tried to do happened or nothing happened. Um, consistency means that when you run a transaction, you, uh, your transaction starts uh, with a consistent state of the database, and it ends with a consistent state of the database. It might be the same state, or it might be a different one, but it should be consistent. Um, isolation is kind of the primary uh, focus of, of this talk, and I think it's really fair to use your, your intuition about what isolation means, but um, the official uh, definition of, of this is something along the lines of, if you have a bunch of transactions that are running at the same time, um, they can be run as if they were run one after the other serially. And then durability means that the things that you write and committed, you expect to be able to, um, that they stay there until you delete them at least. Um, so what we're going to talk about is how we can control isolation and in effect uh, control consistency. So not too much about durability, maybe a little bit about atomicity in this talk. 
Um, Active Record is awesome. It gives us this really helpful object model for dealing with our data. And it even gives us uh, some controls for, for transactions. So we can start a transaction, we can roll back a transaction. As of Rails 4, we can even control the isolation level. Um, so that's, uh, that's super helpful. Um, but unfortunately, it might hide some of the finer points about what's going on with the database uh, that, that we need to know about to make our, um, our code behave like we expect. So um, many of you may have used transactions and you uh, take a block of code which you think should have those kind of uh, acid properties and you wrapped it in an active uh, record-based transaction block and um, then we hope that everything goes right. Well, uh, let's take a look at a scenario of an app called the uh, Congrats app. So um, this is just an imaginary app, but it's an app to uh, send a card from a group of people to one person, uh, usually probably to congratulate them. So you can go in, you can create a card, identify a recipient, and uh, set a group of people who can sign that card, maybe leave a note, and then set a send by date. So people can come in and, and sign and remove their signature um, or update their note. Um, and then we have a send by date. So uh, say that um, not everyone has signed by that send by date, uh, we go ahead and send it. Um, if you've ever tried to collaborate and get a bunch of people to sign a card for somebody, you know there's always some stragglers. So we'll just put that into our app. So let's say that um, we have this timeline. So Edie gets a promotion, that's pretty awesome. Um, Edie has a friend named Pat who is really cool and decides that they want to send a congratulatory uh, card to Edie and invites uh, Dana and Reese. So Dana is totally on top of things, signs right away, um, but then some drama happens between Dana and Edie. I don't know what it is, but I'd love to speculate. Um, <laughs> so uh, also it's a totally imaginary scenario, so I can make it up whatever I want, but um, that's not the important bit. The important bit is that the next thing that happens is that Reese finally signs, and Dana, at the exact same time, decides to remove their signature. Um, so we've set up our app so that Edie's getting a card. But when, is, when are they gonna get it? Whose signatures are gonna be on it? It's not really obvious from this, right? So let's zoom in on that, uh, somewhat, that simultaneous event. So this could be one way that happens. So Reese says, clicks the sign button, it comes to our controller, we say load the card with the signatures, add Reese's signature, see if everybody signed, and if, uh, if everybody has signed, then go ahead and send the card. At the same time, uh, Dana clicks, like, remove me, I no longer want to be associated. Um, and we load their signature and then delete it. Um, so this could, it could happen this way, depending on, um, you know, garbage collection or whatever, it could happen this way. Um, who knows? So uh, what's supposed to happen in either of these scenarios? What do we intend to happen? Well, it could go, two ways um, as far as I can see. One is that we don't send the card until the send by date and only the people who intended to sign during that entire timeline are represented. And I think that's probably what I would want. Uh, so like Dana's signature is not on there, um, but everybody else's is. Um, uh, but we could also end up sending the card before the send by date and still having deleted data, Dana's signature from the database. So at some point, um, even in our, not only have we misrepresented what everybody wanted, um, in our database we have a card that was sent with, before the send by date without all the signatures. So that seems bad. Um, so why, why can we end up in these inconsistent states? Um, well, when we actually do the sending, we're assuming that the context from before hasn't changed. We, we just made a decision based on, on that context. So the, the thing that we have to know is, um, even though we talked about those ACID transactions, um, what went wrong is that the database actually makes trade-offs. So 
We relax, uh, the databases relax isolation to improve concurrency and performance. So we, the, the database says in certain cases, we don't have to be as strict. And I put this really cute dog photo on there so that you'd remember this really key important part. Uh, so remember the blissed out dog. Um, so there's actually a spectrum of isolation that we can choose and it trades off between performance cost and, um, and how isolated you are. And don't try and read all these right now, we'll, we'll go through them. Um, but you are always in one of these isolation levels, no matter what. And depending on which database you're in, you might be in one by default or another one by default. And also, depending on which database you're in, uh, it might implement these differently because the requirements are only minimum requirements. Uh, each, at e every level, it could actually be more isolated than is specified. So let's go through these. Um, read uncommitted uh, TLDRs, th there's no guarantee about isolation. Right? You, there's, there's nothing that is, is required of the database to isolate your transaction. So you can, in fact, even read uh, rows that have been updated or inserted in other transactions that haven't even committed yet. Um, and that means that if you read data during your transaction, um, if you read it again, it could be totally different. There's no warning and you don't know where it came from. And in fact, it might even roll back. So uh, it's, it's really, you have no guarantees whatsoever. Um, I can't think of a really good reason to use this for production code, but I have actually used it for uh, sneaking a peek at um, what's going on in MySQL in production if I have a really long running transaction. Um, so for uh, the next level up is read committed. So in this case, um, when you read something from the database, you're guaranteed that it has at least been committed by another transaction. Um, however, that means that you still may, have, may be able to read data twice and it be different um, without you having changed anything in, in that transaction. So it still doesn't sound super isolated, but it's better than reading somebody's kind of like half done work. Um, and then there's, there's no real warning if anything happened. Um, and this is what Postgres chooses its default. Um, repeatable read is the next level up. So this means that once you've read a row, um, if you try and read it again, uh, you'll only see uh, changes that you've made to it. So at this point, we're now in a place where the things that we kind of touch during our transaction are now consistent within, uh, within the transaction. So that, that's a pretty nice guarantee. Um, and what happens is if you read something and then um, start updating things, the database will warn you and say, hey, you just did something based on something that changed and committed to a different state by the time you were done with your transaction. So you may want to do something else. So it won't fix anything. It's not an automatic fix, um, but it is a really helpful warning. Um, you can still end up with inconsistent data in this, um, in this level. Uh, it's a little bit harder, but uh, it's definitely possible. Um, and then this is what MySQL chooses as its default, although, as I, again, I said, it's implemented differently from Postgres. Uh, serializable is uh, basically full isolation. So um, transactions can only happen in a way that they could be, they could have been written serially. Uh, so this is uh, hopefully an implementation of that full I in the ACID spec. Um, it's pretty, I, I could not think of a way to get inconsistent data without like incorrect code in this, um, with this level. But uh, if you think of what a way or you know of a way, let me know, I think it'd be really interesting and the, then this is the most expensive. So let's go back to our scenario and see um, what would happen if we used uh, repeatable read um, or serializable uh, with, our, with this scenario that happened before. So if we got to the end of the transaction in, in Reese's transaction and say Dana's committed before, then um, we would get a warning from the database that says, hey, sorry, your assumptions changed. Whatever you did, um, you can't rely on that. We're gonna roll back everything and, and try again. So uh, that's at least a helpful warning to you to help you know that you have to do something else. 
Um, it's also possible that Dana could have gotten a rollback and said, sorry, we couldn't have deleted your signature before we sent the, the card, but at least to be able to warn the user in that case. Um, so everything I talked about before uh, is basically uh, just for uh, SQL, we didn't really need to know anything about uh, Rails or Ruby yet, but um, as I mentioned, you can enable isolation in, uh, in Rails as of Rails 4, and what you do is uh, when you have a transaction block, you um, specify an isolation level on, as an argument to the transaction block. So cool. We're all done, right? It was less than one line of code for this whole talk, it's simply a parameter change, uh, yeah, not quite. Uh, so I'm, as I mentioned, as you increase the, um, the isolation guarantees, your performance uh, may suffer, and it may suffer because, well, there's, there is actually more load on the database as well, you may hold locks, things like that. Um, you may have to repeat transactions, um, but that, that's the cost of doing business there. And depending on how you implement things, you may introduce deadlocks. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. It actually looks a lot like those uh, serialization errors that we saw before, but um, it's another thing that might come up. So um, what's actually special about ORMs and an active record? Um, well, there's this great abstraction that reads from the database for you at uh, times that are uh, that allow caching and then it caches things and it also writes to the database and it may do that at any time so you actually don't always really know um, if the data that you're being uh, that you're reading um, has been read into a model yet um, so we have to go through special procedures like preloading and eager loading or uh, refreshing so um, in order to get this great facility from the, the database that warns us when our isolation uh, has, has, been, uh, ha has a problem, we need to give a hint to the database to tell it, um, hey, I, I'm using this data and I'm making assumptions based on it and my logic, my application logic needs that. So um, let's consider how we might implement that send by date that, that we mentioned. So. Uh, one thing that we could do is use an active job implementation, and if you're familiar with active job, it's really cool, um, or if you're not, it's also cool. Uh, <laughs> but, um, one thing that you can do is call these jobs and say, perform this later on this model. So maybe we've got a card model, and we say, um, send the card at the send by date later on uh, with uh, with this card, and it does this really cool magic. Underneath the hood, it says, I know what this card is, I'm going to take an ID, stick that into whatever our store is for our, uh, our background job queue, maybe it's Redis or Active uh, MQ or something like that, and then when, when I call you back in this perform method, uh, I'm gonna re, uh, reform that card for you and pass it in. Um, Unfortunately, what that means is that the read for the database happened outside the transaction. So we thought we could um, use the serializable isolation level uh, for, for the body of this, um, this active job, but it turns out that the database has no way of knowing that we're using the data in the card to make our assumptions. So um, one thing that we can do to improve that, unfortunately, we have to kind of not let uh, active job uh, get the card for us, um, but we it's not too bad. We can just introduce an additional, uh, additional line here, pass in the card ID um, to, to perform the job later, and then grab it within the transaction. So now the database knows, hey, we're, this is something that we're using for our, for our logic. Um, but there's a problem. Uh, what if we sent a card in the actual mail and then the database told us, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Um, somebody's gonna have to go digging through the post box uh, and that's not great. So, um, so we can try something else. So this is another technique that you can use, um, which is we'll still continue to pass the card ID and we'll still grab it within the course of the transaction. And then maybe we'll add a Boolean field to the card table that says, um, are we committed to send? 
And what we want to do in terms of getting the, the logic here is we want to say, we're only going to send the card in the mail when this field goes from false to true. Never again. So, so it should happen um, really at most once, and depending on how we, it might happen at least once as well, depending on how we deal with our jobs. But here we kind of guarantee that happens at most once. And so in this, um, in this second line here with the return, we're, we're making a decision based on what we read from the database. It, is this committed to send? If not, then continue on, say we are committed to send. And then the only way that we can either uh, exit the transaction and continue on to the next line or exit the transaction without a rollback is if, that, if our assumption went from false to true and we use the database to helpfully get us from one state to the, to the next just once. Um, got to watch out for loops too. Uh, so one thing that you might think about doing is sending like a reminder email to everybody who hasn't signed a card yet and it's before their send by date. So one thing you might think is um, I'm just going to do this loop in a, uh, in a transaction, do them all at once. And um, that might be safe and it might be okay too if, there, if you know that this doesn't happen or if there's not very many cards like that or not very many reminders to send out. Um, but you may also experience a lot of rollbacks. So really you're just, uh, you gotta watch out for the surface area of your transactions. So it, it's better if you don't make a lot of assumptions and then make a lot of uh, actions based on those assumptions. So um, classic advice, keep your, keep your transactions small. Um, if you do decide to do that, though, at least try and put an ordering, a consistent ordering on the way that you access resources. Here, we're only accessing them from one table, but um, it, we at least should try and uh, access them in, say, an ID order or something that's consistent between transactions. Otherwise, you could lead to, to deadlocks. Not going to talk too much about that, but that's another thing that uh, I would recommend digging into a little bit more if you haven't uh, come across database deadlocks. Um, that's another huge topic. Um, so maybe a better idea would be to uh, go and get um, all of the cards that you think might uh, not that might need a reminder, and then do a transaction around each one and then explicitly do a reload within the transaction block to say, hey, uh, go get this from the database again, tell it that we're using this data, and then make our uh, decision based on what we read within the transaction, and then send it if, if need be. Um, and a little trick you can do is just select the ID, and then if you do a reload, it'll actually reload all the fields for you. Um, so we talked about how to configure and use all of the uh, all the database isolation levels, but how do you actually identify those rollbacks so you can make a decision about whether or not you should do something? Well, um, if uh, if you're running a transaction, what will happen is it will throw uh, Active Record will throw this Active Record statement invalid uh, error. Um, unfortunately, at the current state of things, the exact nature of that statement invalid could be anything. <laughs> it could be that your SQL is invalid or something else. Um, so uh, Active Record does provide this cause field on, um, on this statement invalid error, and then it, what's attached is database driver specific, not just database specific. Um, Postgres is, is pretty well uh, typed, and then within there you can decide to try or re or do not retry, depending. Uh, to paraphrase Yoda, um, <laughs> and um, MySQL uh, has done less uh, less with the inheritance tree here, <laughs> so it's just error. Um, and these also might all be different for JDBC as well. So uh, you really have to. The best way to do this is try and create scenarios where you will run into uh, isolation errors and see what's thrown, unfortunately. Um, we haven't talked at all about tests, but also I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this leads to trouble with tests. So between each test, um, for most tests, ideally you, what you can do is set up a transaction before the test runs, run all your logic, and then when it's done, roll it back and get back to the state that you started at. 
um, possibly empty or possibly with some seed data. And that's great. It's super fast, and it's um, it, it's a really consistent way of, of dealing with, with test data. Um, unfortunately, uh, once a transaction has been started, you cannot change the transaction level. Um, so if you're testing code that changes the transaction level, you probably are going to want to use uh, deletion or truncation strategies for your database cleaner. Um, so I wrote a little poem to <laughs> mention this. This is just to say that I've slowed the tests that were in transactions, and you, which you're probably hoping would remain fast. Forgive me, they were so simple and so clean and so clear. But now they're not. Sorry. Also, apologies to William Carlos Williams. Um, so some more testing considerations. How do you actually test the concurrency here? It's actually really hard. I don't have a great answer for you. I'm not going to lie. Um, so one thing you can do is load testing. Uh, this is more likely to come up with load testing. Um, and then the other thing you can do is uh, kind of manually test it. And this really stinks, but um, you can try and add random sleeps to things um, just to prove at least to yourself what kinds of errors come up and that they're handled. Um, this, yeah, I, I can't say sorry enough for that, but it, it totally works and it works really consistently, but it's really hard to automate. Um, so if anybody comes up with some great ideas for testing, that would be awesome. So um, let's do a quick review. Uh, so um, remember my top uh, happy dog uh, slide, Databases try to trade isolation for performance. Um, the database and active record will let you choose the level. Um, but choosing it may require uh, code and test changes, and, and it's a performance hit. It's not just a performance hit. And I say it's worth it for the correctness. Uh, I mean, when I say it's worth it, I mean it's required. <laughs> uh, there's not really much else you can do. You just kind of have to do it. Um, so yeah. Um, so I added this slide after I saw uh, both DHH's and, and Eileen's talk, and I, I realized as I was going through this talk, this kind of sucks. You know? <laughs> this is really hard. And when you saw like the final form of that of that job, I hope that like or I don't know if you was like me, I was like, wow, this really looks like threading code, and that's really kind of rough. So. Um, I don't think it has to be this way. I think we can do more with this, and I think um, the more people understand this and kind of get an idea of the use cases for this, maybe we can do better and try and push some of this stuff further down the stack. Maybe we can figure out when uh, we entered a transaction that changed the isolation, it was very specific about the isolation level, and we explicitly reread things so that we um, so that we can hint to the database that it uh, that we made assumptions on that data, something like that. Um, but we can definitely compress the concept down into Rails and Active Record. I'm not totally sure how yet, but there's there's definitely work that that we could be doing with that. Um, cool. I just saw that. Uh, so thanks to Slides Carnival, which I use this uh, nice slide deck under Creative Commons Attribution, and um, thanks everybody. Thank <laughs> you.